Hey guys, Dave Keller here with StockCharts.com. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at uh, StockCharts in Redmond, Washington. It's a pleasure to have you with us on this Top 5 Charts of 2022 special uh, holiday edition here at the end of 2022. The end of the year is a normal sort of natural time to look back at the last uh, 12 months and uh, reflect on what we've learned. Uh, hopefully uh, think about uh, what we can do to improve on our decision making, improve on our process for next year. And I'm uh, thrilled that you've been in some small way part of the journey with us in 2022. It has been an eventful year. If you're not convinced on the value of looking at charts for risk management for idea generation, I don't know if I can help you at this point because this has been a year where I feel like following the charts and recognizing shifting change in sentiment as reflected in measures of price, trend, and momentum. I don't think there's a better argument for the value of using a, a proper technical toolkit. Through the course of these top five charts of 2022, we've hit on some of the key themes of the year from a technical perspective. Our first show, we started with the S&P 500, thinking about the big picture structure over the last couple of years off of the uh, COVID low to the high in the beginning of 2022, using Fibonacci retracements, other measures of price, uh, support and resistance levels, and just thinking about this structure, key levels to think about going forward. We then talked about interest rates. We talked about the 10-year treasury yield, the shape of the yield curve, value versus growth. And on day two, we were reviewing some of those uh, leadership themes in 2022 and what to look for going forward. Our third day, we talked about non-equity asset classes, particularly the dollar, crude oil, and gold, and how they all relate to each other and how they relate to the equity markets, sort of measures of risk on and risk off and so forth. On day four on yesterday's show, we talked about uh, Alphabet. We looked at one individual name, uh, a key mega cap stock in the U.S., and how it was such a brilliant illustration of the rotation that occurred from an accumulation phase in 2021 to a distribution phase in 2022. Today, we wrap up those top five charts, looking at what I simply called the chart. I got into this a number of years ago. Um, I was sort of, uh, you know, people would ask me like, what what chart should they use? What's the one chart? And, uh, you know, jokingly, I would tell them the story that uh, when I ran a technical research team at Fidelity, uh, we would have this uh, meeting occasionally where everyone had to bring one chart, right? And it was sort of like a one chart meeting. All right, everyone bring one chart uh, and then we'll all contribute it and we all talk about it. And people would love to game the system. Uh, you know, some would say when I said one chart, that meant one page. So they would cram as many charts as possible onto one day. I have like nine charts in a cluster. So I called them out on that and said, no, it's one chart. So what people do is do one chart and then have little like breakout things, right? So they would highlight a thing and make it be like a little separate little breakout. So eventually their one chart had like other charts integrated into their larger chart. It was just, it was so funny to me how we were so desperate to get one thing, right? It's what that, what's that one thing, that holy grail thing that we can watch to make sense of things. In reality, you're, you're chasing a mirage, right? There's never one thing. However, I have learned that it's really helpful to have, you know, the chart. When people say, what's the chart I should look at? I just jokingly would say, all right, here's the chart. And it would have four or five data series that I thought told the story of where things were, were at. And a couple of times a year, I'll update the chart and kind of with the uh, with the things that I think reflect the current environment and where we're at. So here at the end of uh, December 2022, I wanted to create the chart that I think tells us about what's happened recently in 2022. And I think these will be really good things to pay attention to at the beginning of 2023. Here is my 2000 year end, uh, 2022 year-end edition of what I call the chart. It's always going to have the S&P on a closing basis uh, at the top because I think not only for me, it's a reminder that not only does the S&P tell us uh, the report, it doesn't not only just tells us what's happened, but it also has predictive value in its own. And, uh, you know, by analyzing trend, by an analyzing momentum, by analyzing highs and lows, uh, and the trend of those over time, I think you have a good sense of where things are headed. In 2022, one of the big takeaways has been we've been rotated from an uptrend to a downtrend. And Charles Dow would tell you that is very easy to define, right? Look at the trend, highs and highs, lows and lows, and where are they going? We'll come back to that and dig into it a little bit, bit later, but I just want to introduce you to these five data series. So we have the S&P on a closing basis. We're going back for the last two years. The second one is the advanced decline line for the New York Stock Exchange, looking only at common stocks, so in, in ignoring closed-end funds and, and things like that, and just looking at uh, common stocks only. Third series down is the percent of stocks in the S&P 500 above their 50-day moving average. Next, we have the S&P 500 bullish percent index, which is using point and figure charts to measure uh, participation. Finally, we have the ratio of consumer discretionary versus consumer staples, and we're using equal weighted ETFs. If you want to know how I set this chart up, if you're a stock charts user at the bottom, just hit pause and you can see these are the settings 
and the indications that I use. These are the tickers that I use to bring up these data series that I'm showing uh, in the chart above. Let's go through each of these. I'll explain them in a little more detail, talk about what they told us in 2022 and what to look for going into next year. So as I mentioned, the S&P on a closing basis is kind of the most standard, most classic way of analyzing the market. One of my um, early mentors, Ralph Akinpora, who's been just such a fantastic uh, mentor and partner through my career uh, so far, and I'm so appreciative and thankful for that. You know, he told me, you know, if you have nothing else, you know, if you're standard, stranded on a desert island, what's the one chart? It should be a, the chart of the S daily chart of the S&P 500. That tells you most of what you need to know. And I've, I've never forgotten that lesson. So the beginning of my day always starts every literal, every, literally every trading day starts with the weekly S&P chart and the daily S&P chart. And, and I think that's inspired by some of those conversations with Ralph early in, uh, in my career. You can see how the S&P has been in a clear downtrend, right? Of lower highs and lower lows, right? The lows keep getting lower. The highs keep getting lower. What's notable when I'm looking at this chart here at year end is look at these really clear bear market rally phases, right? We had a peak in February. The attempt in late March failed, stalled right as we tried to get to a new high. In July and August, we rallied again, failed to really get above the June high with much more. And then we rotated lower. At this point, we appear to be stalling, you know, really failing at the September high, but certainly not getting near the uh, the August time. Now, I don't have things like a trend line or uh, moving averages, but, you know, I think this sort of implies all those other things uh, as well. And just this, you know, sort of trend line. Uh, with the closes, uh, with the highs in, in 2022. It's just such a fantastic illustration of this trend. So, you know, as I'm thinking about how to use this chart going forward, I am certainly going to be watching this line like a hawk. This is taking the January peak, the March peak, and the August peak. Look how well the three of those line up, and look how beautifully that lines up with the fourth peak here in uh, late November. I was taught once is chance, twice is coincidence, three times as a pattern. That was a way to reflect that the more you test a trend line, the more it's validated. Because I would say it's a visual cue. It's a visual representation of the pace of the trend, right? Because we're looking at this on a log scale. This is basically showing you the pace of this trend going lower, which means as long as we keep testing that line, the more we test that line, the more we're reinforcing that that is a pretty good representation of the downtrend. If and when we break through that trend line, that tells you something's different. This is the line I was watching over the last couple of weeks to see if we would power, uh, power above it. Earlier um, you know, uh, in December, we had the Fed meeting, we had inflation data. It looked for a moment like we might just blow right through this trend line. And on an intraday basis, we actually did. On a closing basis, we never broke above it. So going into the new year, this is the line I will absolutely be watching because at some point that trend line is going to get broken to the upside. That could be a confirmation or an indication of high likelihood of further upside from there. The next series down is the advanced decline line for the New York Stock Exchange. We've covered breadth on our show quite a bit in 2022, but basically the advanced decline line, every day you have advancers and you have decliners. How many stocks are up? How many stocks are down? And you can turn that into a net advancer decliner number. And that's a lot of times reported on financial media. And it's a one day measure of how many stocks were up versus down. And that can be a good measure of short term sentiment. If you string together those daily net readings over time, you have what's called a cumulative advanced decline line. It basically takes it into a data, it turns it into a data series. And you're looking at the trend. And in general, the reason why that's important is because in a healthy bullish phase, you will see the market moving higher and you'll see the advanced decline line moving higher because it makes sense that if the index is going higher, that more stocks are closing up than closing down, right? That's ideally what should fuel the market going higher. What interesting thing happened though in January of this year, which is why this series is so important. Look at how the S&P made a new high in January. The advanced decline line did not validate that new high. So the market was going higher, but less stocks in the New York Stock Exchange were actually participating in that uptrend. That often happens at the end of a, bear, a bullish phase. It was a great indication among many that we were exhausted from the uptrend uh, in, uh, in the beginning of this year. From there, the advanced decline line uh, has gone lower. The AD line made a new low in uh, September and into October, along with the S&P 500. From there, it's mirrored the uptrend. So you can see that in general, the trends tend to move. One of the things I would be looking for if we do make a new low in the first quarter is to see if that new low is confirmed by the AD line, because at some point, most likely at the end of a downward phase, you would see the S&P make a new low and you'd see the AD line not make a new low. And that could indicate 
that uh, some more speculative small cap names are maybe starting to improve a little bit as people move a little more risk on. It doesn't always happen. And I've found it's more meaningful at tops than at bottoms, just because of the nature of how things tend to reverse, but certainly a, a chart to pay attention to closely going into the new year. The third series down uh, illustrated here in green is the percent of stocks in the S&P 500 above their 50-day moving average. And I actually thought about which one of these two uh, to use, because I, I look at both the 50-day and the 200-day. The 200-day is a little more longer term. With both of those, though, I think you're looking at a couple of things. Number one, where are we above or below the 50% line? And I'm going to turn on what's called the inspect tool. If you look at the peaks and valleys in this series and then look up to the top, you can see that they coincide pretty well, right? So the low here in mid-June lines up with the low in, uh, in price. The peak here when we got above 90% lines up with the peak in August. We get below 10%. Uh, here again, in uh, and it's pretty much right before the September, October low, we get above 90% here. And you can see that coincides with the uh, the peak so far in early December. So, you know, 90% ended up being a significant level. But if you look from, you know, second half of 21 to first half of 22, we never got above 70% or above or below 30%, right? We're sort of trapped in this range. Then the whole range expanded as markets and stocks really started to fluctuate together and you had these big uh, swings in the indicator. So what I found is 50% is a more confirmational sign, right? So after a bottom, when we're rallying, and the question is, is this rally going to sustain? Look at how in June, coming off the May low, the rally is going into June, but look how we never got above 50%. And you can see that the bull phase fizzled out and we can't kind of came lower. Here, after the June low in mid-July, late July, we actually broke above 50%, which told you there's going to be more upside most likely. Same thing, breaking below 50% here in late August suggested that the top was most likely in. Breaking above 50% here in late October told us the uh, low is most likely in. And then now we're getting very near to the 50% line uh, here in mid-December. I think this is an important chart to watch going into the year and to see if 50% holds or not. A lot of times, you know, if if the market, if this is a brief pullback before the uptrend resumes in January for some reason, um, then this most likely stays above 50% or doesn't get much below that. That would tell you that even though the major indexes are pulling back, most stocks are remaining above that key trend following device, their 50 day moving average. If we go lower and this gets below 50%, that most likely would indicate to me a high a probability of retesting the lows from October, if not even going further down to S&P 3200 or something like that. But this chart is gonna be an important one to watch uh, also to measure breadth. Next down, we have the bullish percent index on the S&P 500. This looks at 500 point and figure charts. Point and figure is a very classic trend following device looking at uptrends and downtrends. A point and figure chart by definition is binary. It's either bullish or bearish based on the most recent signal that you've observed on the chart. So with the bullish percent index, this is an indicator created by Abe Cohen, who was at a firm called Chartcraft. Back in, I want to say the 1960s would be my guess. I apologize. I don't know that in particular. I think it's around then. He wrote some books and, and popularized with his service called Chartcraft. And one of the indicators he created was called the Bullish Percent Index. We've adapted his work and run this series, uh, this uh, these indexes on a bunch of different groups of stocks, individual sectors, and broad indexes as well to measure what percent in the universe are in a bullish point and figure pattern. You can see when this gets above 70%, this is called a bull confirmed. What I have found in 2022 is once it goes above 70%, then trades back lower, that ends up being a meaningful uh, pattern. So here in January, we went above 70% and rotated lower. Look in the top of the chart, how that's right after the January peak. Uh, we then, uh, let's see, here in uh, April, broke above 70% uh, here in late March as the S&P tested that, uh, you know, was really attempting to get above the February highs. We got back below 70% here, which confirmed the fact that the uptrend was exhausted. We went above 70% here in late July and rotated back below in uh, late August, which is basically confirming that this was a top. And then most recently, we went above 70% in early November, just broke below there in the last week or so as we're recording this, indicating that the top is most likely in. So this bullish percent index, you know, you can also look at it, by the way, in uh, in buys. So if you look at when it breaks below 30% and breaks back above, that often uh, coincides with downtrend phases and then confirming an end to that low. So it's been a really good way of thinking about 2022 in terms of extremes and breadth. Uh, most recently, we've gotten a sell signal from this indicator as it went clearly above 70% then clearly below, indicating a top is most likely in for now. I'd be looking as we go into the new year to see if and when we get below 30%, and most importantly, when we come out of that 30% line, that could indicate a confirmed bottom and the next leg higher for stocks. 
Finally, we have one of my favorite measures of uh, offense versus defense, which is looking at the consumer discretionary versus the consumer staples sector. Now we use equal weighted ETFs. The tickers are EW, oh, sorry, RCD uh, for the uh, for the consumer discretionary sector and RHS for the consumer staple sector. And then we use those instead of the uh, more commonly used XLY and XLP because those are cap weighted ETFs based on cap weighted indexes. And what that means is the larger market cap, the larger the company, the larger the weight. And while that can be interesting when you're looking at a broad index and you wanna follow the strength of the largest names, it can skew breadth indicators. I like breadth indicators, measures of performance, measures of strength and weakness to be equal weighted because that means you're looking at the broad participation from all the names in a sector, not just the mega caps like Amazon and Tesla. When you look at an equal weighted version, you can see the clear downtrend that started in November, December. Look, just like the advanced decline lines, look at how the S&P made a new high in January, but it was never confirmed by the uh, this measure of offense versus defense, which is a clear downtrend. It was one of the many indicators that told us to expect weakness. That persisted for about six to eight months. But then from May through December, that series has essentially been sideways, telling you that offense versus defense have been equal. Now, what's interesting is, even though the S&P is technically in a downtrend, you know, when the S&P is at 3,800 or 3,900, we first tested 3,900 back in May. So from May through December for, uh, you know, over six months, about seven months, we fluctuated around that May low, that June low. We really haven't gone much lower, right? We've sort of rotated around that equilibrium price. So I think this is a great measure of the overall sense of stability of this market. The reason why I think this is important is because this ratio notably never broke out, right? So going the June high, the August peak, going into the November, December peak, never did this indicator get above where it was at the beginning of June, never broke out above that. So it was never confirming this idea that these rallies were going to continue on and be true bull market phases. This was very much still in a bear market rally mode. I'd be concerned, and I think one of the biggest risks for this market is if this ratio breaks below the July low, because if that would happen, that would be the first new low since July. That would indicate a clear rotation away from offense into defense, basically away from things you want, consumer discretionary, and into things you need, things like consumer staples. That is meaning that would suggest that investors are rotating to a very bearish positioning, more defensive positioning, trying to ride out market uncertainty. If that would happen, simply look for when the ratio starts to rotate higher, because that would indicate investors finally moving to a more risk on posturing. So again, this last and final chart of the top five charts of 2022 is one I simply call the chart. It's combining five key measures of price, breadth, and leadership to recognize uh, the risk on versus risk off mentality. I like to use this chart to think about uh, underneath, you know, besides looking at the overall trends in the S&P 500, what other indicators can help me confirm or validate what I'm seeing with price? So is there any disagreement with some of these measures of participation, measures of risk versus the major uh, index? Because a lot of times at inflection points, you will see some disagreement that tells you a potential change of character is afoot. Folks, it has been such a pleasure to uh, to be with you all this year on The Final Bar and so much fun to bring with you these uh, top five charts of 2022. We're taking the holiday season off to uh, regroup, to celebrate the holidays with our families. We'll be back with you in January. Excited to bring The Final Bar back to you. We have a lot of really exciting things planned for the show. We have our brand new Stock Charts TV studio with some really cool capabilities that we'll be unleashing to you in the first quarter of next year. And this show should grow in its uh, in its scope and its capabilities. So a lot of fun, a lot of good conversations and analysis to share with you in the new year. But until then, have a wonderful and blessed holiday season. Be well and be safe. And we'll see you in the new year. Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.